equals MA, where A is T double dot, and omega, or sorry, um, W is, is the wrench is, is the force, and this is therefore the mass matrix, and it's the uh, twist wrench, the mass twist wrench matrix that relates, you know, right here, that relates uh, wrenches to acceleration twists. Okay? Okay, so, so there it is, and it's a six by six matrix, okay? So to make a mass matrix for, a, you know, if you're doing it just a parallel system, meaning there's two rigid bodies directly connected to each other, one of the rigid bodies is going to be grounded, so you don't care about the mass of that. Then all you do is you find the mass of a single stage. Okay, what you do is you find its, its mass, you find its center of mass, you define a coordinate system, the principal coordinate system at its center of mass, and then you find the mass moments of inertia. Uh, you can construct, therefore, an inertia matrix. You know, you, you find the L and N1, N2, and N3 uh, things, construct the N uh, and find the inverse and the non-inverse, then do this. Boom, you've got your mass uh, Twist, you know, twist wrench mass matrix. Okay, so let's do an example of one that's a little trickier. Here that we have, you know, it's not outside the scope of this course to do combinations of rectangular prism masses, okay? So for instance, this guy is, here's one rectangular prism, but there's this big long extension stuck on the bottom of it, so this, you need to consider the mass of this whole thing here, okay? Um, so we're going to do an example to show how would you do that, right? Okay, so um, again, this is the exact same example we used to find the stiffness matrix. We ignored everything about the stages when we found the stiffness matrix. We just took the stiffness of those and found the stiffness matrix. Now we're going to ignore the mass of these uh, springs, these wire flexure elements, and we're just going to look at the mass and, which, and the shape and everything of, of the uh, stage and what it's made of and everything. Okay, so we're going to make the mass matrix. Okay, so first find the center of mass. So, so what we're going to do here is we're going to try and find, uh, you know, first of all, the mass of this whole stage would be find the volume of this times it by rho, find the volume of this times it by rho, and then add those together. That's the mass of the whole stage. So, but now we're going to find the center of mass of this T-shaped strange stage here. Okay. Well. Remember, our global coordinate system here is on the top surface of that body. Okay, it goes in the x, y, and z direction, and it's right in the center. This is a square that's 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. That's on the top flat surface of that, and the x, y, and z are located in orthogonal directions to all the features there. Okay? So, uh, let's first find a vector that points, okay, First on the center of mass of the stage, there are two parts of the stage, one and two. So here's part one and part two. Since we already know the centers of mass of each of these rectangular parts, or at their center, because they have uniform density, we can use this knowledge to find the center of mass of the entire stage. Okay? So the center of mass of part one is zero, zero, negative one centimeter, which in meters is this. Okay? You can see it's halfway down the stage, right in the middle. Okay? The center of mass of part two would be zero, zero, negative 12, because you have to go down 2 centimeters, and then this is 20 centimeters long, so half of that is 10 centimeters plus 2 is 12, okay? So that points to the center of that. Okay, then the way you find the center of mass of the whole stage is you would take rho, assuming there's the same density in all this, which is, you know, the density of aluminum is 269, 2,698,000.9 kilograms per meter cubed. You take that row times the volume of stage, you know, of, 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 of the, the first part of that stage, times it by that vector, add it to rho times the volume of the second part of the stage, two, okay, so that's, that's the mass of that stage, or that portion of the stage, okay, times it by u2, which is the center mass of that portion of the stage, then divided by the mass of the entire stage, which is volume of 1 plus volume of 2, added together is the volume of the entire stage times rho. Okay? So, so again, you take the mass of this stage times by the center of mass of that stage. Take the mass of this stage times the center of mass of that stage. Add them together, divided by the mass of the entire stage, and you got it. Okay? If you do that, you plug in all these things, notice rows cancel, and, and you will get this. Okay? So, negative 0 0.07769 meters from the top down to the center of mass, okay?
Okay, so now we know the mass of the whole stage, which is this guy. We know the center of mass of the stage. Okay, so we're, we're on our way, okay? And it is, by the way, the magnitude is, if we have a vector that points down to the center of mass of the stage, it is essentially 7.8 centimeters. This is, this is um, simplified. It would actually be 7.769 centimeters. Um, but just for simplification, we're going to call it 7.8 centimeters here. Okay, we're going to round it. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so great. So there's the center of mass. Now we're going to define a coordinate system located at the stage's center of mass. Okay, so we've, we've, we know the mass of the stage, we know the center of mass of the stage, we're going to define a coordinate system. And again, uh, it should be pretty easy, just from symmetry and the beauty of the stage, to identify the most convenient coordinate system directions that will correspond with obviously the principal, uh, you know, principal directions that make the inertia tensor, uh, you know, be diagonal. Okay? But again, you don't need to know what inertia tensor is, you don't need to know about diagonal, you don't need to know anything. Just pick coordinate systems that are convenient, okay? So, and, and again, we could have had x coming out and y going this way, we could have had x coming this way and y going this way, we could have done anything we want as long as all three are perpendicular to the, the faces of the stage and um, as long as they follow the right-hand rule. So x with y with z, okay? And here we just made our life easy. We, we align them with, you know, the x and x prime are the same, y and y prime are the same, z, z prime are the same. But if you do that, you know, you'll still get the right answer if you mix it all up, but it's just going to make your life difficult. So you might as well just align them with the global coordinate system if you can, okay? If you can't, definitely make sure you align them with the principal axes, okay? Okay, and so let's, let's define n1, n2, and n3. Okay, again, n1 better correspond with x prime, n2 better correspond with y prime, and n3 better correspond with z prime. Okay, um, there are no brainers in this case because we align them with the global coordinate system. They're just 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Make sure their magnitudes are all 1, which they are here. So we have an L vector, which is 0, 0, negative, you know, whatever that value we found for the center mass. We have the n1, n2, and n3 unit vectors. Okay. Okay, now we can make a transformation matrix. If we plug the, that L vector from the previous slide uh, and these N1, N2, and N3 into the, the transformation matrix, we get this. We can invert it, we get this. Remember, don't forget your signs, and don't forget to use MATLAB when you do this. Don't, don't do this by hand. Certainly wouldn't expect you to do inverses of a six by six matrix by hand, um, okay? So, um, okay, so, but that's that. So you found your n vectors here, so you found this part, this part, and you've got your uh, delta there that you know that it's, it's uh, right, you just look it up, that's the thing that switches the, the angular and linear component. So you have almost all of this. Now you just have to find the inertia uh, matrix here in, up in that uh, top right corner, the in matrix, okay? And you're already halfway there too because now you, you, you already know the mass of the full stage. You know the center of mass of the stage, and you have your, your principal axes defined. So now, now you really just need to find um, the uh, mass moments of inertia, Ix prime and Iy prime and Iz prime, now you're gold. Okay? But this is a little trickier than you might think. Okay? So we're going to have to use the parallel axis theorem here, which I, which I taught you to do this, uh, to find the inertia matrix. Okay? So to calculate Ix prime, determine the shortest distance d1 between the center of mass and the, of the stage and the center of mass of part one. Okay, so so th this this is the center of mass right here of the entire system. That, that's the x prime, y prime, z prime. Okay, but we need to find what we need to do is we need to add um, we need we need to find the mass moment of inertia of the entire stage if we rotate around x prime. To do that. Let's consider what the mass moment of inertia would be of just stage one, you know, the portion of the stage that's labeled one, if we rotate it around x prime. And then we could add that to the mass moment of inertia of just stage two if we rotate around i x prime, okay? So let, let's first do with part one. Well, you find the shortest distance between these, and by the way, this is not the global coordinate system. This is the center of mass of just stage one, okay, which is why you have all these parentheses ones around it. Okay, stage one center of mass. Okay, the distance between those you'll find is that distance from the global coordinate system to the center of mass. Subtract one centimeter because 
remember, remember this is two centimeters. The center of mass of this stage is one centimeter down. Okay, so you would take, uh, let's see, you would take this L vector and you'd, you would uh, you know, add it by one centimeter, essentially. And, and to do that, you'd, you'd find it is this, D1, and that's this added to one centimeter, the last one added to one centimeter. Okay, so that's the shortest distance between those. Okay, and now well, let's find the shortest distance between the center of mass of the entire stage and the center of mass of just stage two, the portion two, which is this big rectangular thing. And, uh, you know, we, we already found the distance to the center of mass of this, and so you just subtract it, and you, you find this shortest distance, and trust me, it's this, but actually don't trust me. Go back and prove this to yourself, okay? And now what you can do is, so you already know Ix1, you know the mass moment of inertia uh, about the axis that goes through X1 here and goes through the center of mass of body one. Um, because, remember, we know how to find that for a rectangular uh, prism stage shape. Then you add it to the shortest distance between this and this D1 squared plus rho V1. Okay, so this is the parallel axis. This tells you right here the mass moment of inertia of rotating just portion 1 about this X prime axis. Okay, and then you do the same thing to find the mass moment of inertia about X prime of just portion 2 of the stage about that axis. And you can add them because now you're adding apples with apples, okay? You're, you're finding what both of them together are rotating those together, right? So, so this would be Ix2, okay, which is the mass moment of inertia around this thing, okay? And, and this is trivial to find. And then, then this is d2 squared rho v2 squared, okay? And likewise, you can do the same thing with Iy prime, the rotation about this guy. Okay, you do the rotation about uh, the first body, and the rotation about the second body, okay? And uh, we're using these, these different distances and everything. And then if you wanted to add the rotation about the Z, well, they're shared. The Z axis of all three of these, this one, this one, and this one, they're all shared. So if you just take, you don't need to do the mass moment of inertia because they already go through the Z axis um, the z-axis mass moment of inertia already goes through the center of mass of all three of them, right? The center of mass of the whole stage, the stage two and stage three, or, or sorry, stage one, stage two, and the center of mass of both of them. So you just add this one plus that one, and you get this one, okay? And then um, now you can calculate this. Here's all these values. If, you know, I said these were trivial to find, uh, these, these, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six values, Okay, and here they all are, one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are all the values, and I give you all the, the things. I, I do encourage you to go back and, and uh, correct my math, make sure all these equations are, are true, because you could be asked to find uh, the mass moments of inertia of, of a stage like this that consists of two rectangular prisms um, that are nice and symmetric and everything clean uh, to use the, the, the um, uh, you know, the... the uh, uh, parallel axis theorem and, and know how to use use all that. Okay, so so stare at this slide for a while. Uh, you could calculate all these things. You could plug it into all these things, and now you would know um, the inertia matrix, which is the first three diagonal components are i x prime, this one, this one, and this one. Okay, and then the last three is just the mass of the entire stage, which is rho times v one plus v two on the, all the other three. Then all the other things in that matrix are zero except the diagonal, okay, components. Okay, and again, that's because you wisely chose your coordinate system at the center of mass to align with the principal axes of the, uh, of the stage, okay? Okay. Um, okay, so if you do that, if you plug it in for all these values, you, if you plug all the, you know, we, I gave you these uh, these values of B and H and E and L and all, you know, if you look back at the initial slide, plug it all in, calculate the inertial matrix, and you will get this. This is the inertia matrix, okay? And again, here's what a diagonal matrix looks like, okay? It's all zero except the diagonal. And make sure you put the units correctly on this. Notice this is just kg, and this is kgm squared, okay? Right here, okay? And, and then uh, we already found the n and the delta and the n raised to negative 1. 
And so you plug it all in this equation and you have your mass twist wrench uh, matrix is this. Okay? And again, it did not consider the mass of the uh, flexures. Okay? One quick little caveat thing, if you did want to consider the mass of the flexures, because obviously the flexures, the, the flexible elements do have some mass, and their mass is moving, and it does have some inertia. A good way to, to make your mass matrix more accurate and take the mass of those flexures into consideration is just assume that half the length of the flexure, so about there, there to there, is just a solid rigid mass that's stuck onto your stage. Okay, so instead of, instead of modeling the stage as, as this guy in this, this rectangular prism, model as this guy in this rectangular prism, and a rectangular prism half the length down, rectangular prism half the length down, half the length down, half the length down, and imagine it's all stuck to it as a, as a single rigid body. Because when things deform, when one, you know, if this is grounded, and this stage deforms, no matter how it deforms, approximately half this mass doesn't really even move, it basically stays at the ground, and then the other half essentially moves with the stage. And of course it deforms, but you're going to model it as infinitely rigid, um, and, and that tends to make the mass matrix a little more accurate. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, we, we, when we do the stiffness matrix, there's, there's really no way to uh, consider the, sti the stiffness, the compliance of the stage. We assume the stage is infinitely rigid, and we, we assume all the compliance is in the flexures, the, the wire flexures, um, from head to toe, you know, top to bottom. We're considering the whole compliance of those, but that's the only compliance we consider in this. Um, when we do the stiffness matrix, when we do the mass matrix, we, we either consider just the mass matrix of the stage, or we can consider the mass matrix of the stage with half the length of the flexures going into it. Um, and that's, that's a very doable thing to do. Um, and you'll get more accurate results, okay? Um, you may find if you compare it with FEA that, that half is somewhat arbitrary. You could do a third the length or, or you know, um, or, or, you know, it's just a different fraction. But I've found in my experience half is about a pretty good rule of thumb to use when you're doing that. But that's just a trick to make your mass matrix a little more accurate. Okay, um, but this, this doesn't do it. This just assumed all the mass is in that T-shaped stage and no mass is in any part of the flexures. Okay, and that's this mass matrix if you want to check my math on that. Okay, so now we have, we know for any parallel system that consists of two rigid bodies connected directly together by rectangular prisms, be they wires or blades, um, or, or living hinges or, or you know nub flexures, but make sure if you do those you use Timoshenko equations um, for the stiffness matrix. For, for any of those things we know how to build the mass and the stiffness matrix. Okay? Um, Alright, so how do we use those mass and stiffness matrices to do anything useful? Well, let's look at uh, basic uh, dynamic uh, math here. Okay? Um, assume you have a, a mass you know, this is a, a one-dimensional mass, essentially, um, uh, that can only move in a straight line. Here's your sp stiffness K. It's, it's on a spring. Say we load it with a force along its single direction. It can be loaded, and it displaced along that single direction with X, okay? Well, you know from Newton's equations that you can take the force that you load it with um, and subtract it by uh, the resisting force caused by the spring, which is negative kx. It's negative because it always resists. Um, and, and then uh, we're just going to assume there's no damping. Say it's not in a fluid and I don't see a dash spot on there. So we're not, nor if you did, you'd say negative cx prime, or so sorry, x dot, which is the derivative, which is velocity, right? It's the derivative of displacement with respect to time. Um, or if there was other forces like gravity, you could add those in there. But we're just going to assume there's no gravity, there's no damping, it, there's just the stiffness, okay? And you add it all up, all the forces, and you set those equal to mass times acceleration, which is m times x double dot, which is the derivative of x, double derivative of x with respect to time. Okay, so that basically says f equals ma, okay? So that's Newton 101, right? Okay, well let's rearrange this, and now we get this equation, where this is the input force, here is the mass, times acceleration, here's the stiffness times displacement, okay? Okay, and note this equation neglects damping, okay? So, 
that, that's just the single, simplified, one-dimensional thing of kind of a point mass on a spring that can only move in one direction. But what if you actually have something real that's an actual compliant mechanism with an actual stage, uh, you know, connected to ground by real, uh, you know, um, rectangular prism flexible elements, okay? And, and say, you know, uh, we are loading it with some wrench vector, that's the load, you know, and of course it would be with respect to the global coordinate system, the first three components would be the force, the next three components would be the torque, um, you know, on this stage, and, and, and we want to find how does it in result move, uh, what, what's the twist, it, is if we assume that point is stuck on that stage and the first three components of the rotation, last three components of the displacement of that, uh, that point, okay? Well, um, if you're considering both the mass and the, the, the stiffness, which you should do, because that's in reality what happens, then it's the same equation, really, except instead of force, you do wrench, and instead of displacement, you use twist, uh, displacement twist, instead of acceleration, x double dot, you use t double dot, and instead of just k, you use the stiff, six by six stiffness matrix, twist wrench stiffness matrix, and instead of just m, you use the six by six mass twist wrench uh, matrix, okay? All right, and then you can move that again, and there you go. That's that's Newton in matrix form in for a 3D parallel system. So it's the same. And again, this ne neglects damping. If we had damping in here, in this top equation, we have negative some six by six twist wrench damping matrix times T dot, and that would be in there. But we're going to ignore that. And by the way, you can largely ignore that um, when you're analyzing uh, flexures. You know, partic particularly if it's a uh, you know, single crystal flexures in space, for instance, <laughs> or something, where there's there's no, um, you know, there, there's no fluid surrounding it, damping it, and um, as it vibrates, uh, you know, there's there's very little internal losses. There's still, you know, even even flexures that uh, vibrate in space, you say, or in in a in a pure vacuum, even in space isn't a pure vacuum, but say it's an absolute pure vacuum, um, uh, you know. You know, and, and say you're not plastically deforming it, or there's no hysteresis, there's no micro slip in there. Flexures will still eventually oscillate and ring out because of a number of different interesting principles. But um, but it'll take them a long time. You can essentially neglect damping, and even flexures on Earth with air surrounding them, uh, they do damp out, but um, their damping is, is pretty small. So oftentimes you can responsibly neglect uh, the damping. And the internal damping is, is largely negligible too, as long as you're not plastically deforming it. Okay, so these are reasonable assumptions. Okay, as, as, as they pertain to flexures. Okay, all right. So so now let's look at uh, mode shapes and natural frequencies. Okay, and you know, I'll say what what those equations have showed you have to do with anything. Okay, so let's look at. I'm sure you guys have all seen. You know, let, let's go back to the single one-dimensional kind of um, form here. Um, let's see what, you know, um, let's calculate its natural frequency of this. Well, what, what does natural frequency mean? It, it means what frequency will this mass on the spring vibrate with in its single dimension, you know, it can only move along this direction, right? What, what frequency will it vibrate if we just leave it unloaded? So if we, if we don't load it, if we put zero force on it, say we don't put a force on it, made this blue arrow go away, and I just set that equal to zero. Um, will this just naturally vibrate, with, you know, without stopping? If, if there's no damping around to damp it out, will it just start vibrating naturally? And if it does, what frequency will that be? Well, it will, and that frequency will be the natural frequency, and that's why it's called the natural frequency, because that's what it will naturally vibrate with, okay? And, and you can mathematically prove that, for this equation, with no damping, if you plug in, say, this solution, okay, there's other solutions you could do, you could do A, E, I, omega, T, you know, if you want to consider also the, the um, imaginary part, but that, that's beyond the scope of this course, and it, it really doesn't matter. Um, this is a solution uh, that would capture the, a vibration, right, it's got an amplitude times cosine, which is a sinusoidal vibration, times the, you know, uh, with, with inside the cosine, the frequency times t, okay, and that that will you could also add a, a row there as well, um, you know, for some phase shift kind of thing. But but in any case, you, you plug in this uh, equation, 
and, and of displacement, a sinusoidal displacement, and uh, you plug in here and see if it uh, what natural what what frequency would solve this equation. Okay, because if there's no if there's no x that can solve this equation, then then things won't actually move. But we'll see that this one this gas here solves this equation. So if we plug it in here, um, the double derivative of this, okay, will be negative m omega squared times a cosine omega t. Because remember, the derivative of cosine is negative sign. Okay, and you know, we have a product or a, you know, a chain rule in here. So anyway, took the, the, the derivative of this twice with respect to time, and you get this. And then, and then, and then there's no derivative here. You just plug it in. Okay, so if you take that, plug it in here, you get this. If we massage this around, pull things out, we get k minus m omega squared times this, the original guess. And we find out that that original guess will always work, always solve that problem, as long as this equals zero. In other words, as long as this equals zero. Okay, so th that means, and if we solve for this, by the way, now, that means if omega equals the square root of k divided by m, that means um, as long as this, this frequency here, omega, equals square root k divided by m in there, and we plug that in, regardless of the amplitude and all these things, it will, it will be a solution that will work. It will vibrate at this natural frequency, square root k over m. Okay, so we just proved that um, if there's no damping, okay, um, uh, you know, and, and we just have this linear, or this system that's idealized to only move in a single direction, it's, it's like a point mass on a, on a spring, K, that it will just naturally freak out at the natural freak, it'll just vibrate with a solution that satisfies Newton's equation, as long as that frequency is square root K over N, which is the natural frequency, so we can put a little N here for omega N is natural frequency. And it, I already showed you this in lecture one, but now we just proved it, okay? So now let's look at this, though, interestingly enough, in three dimensions. And, and by the way, the mode shape that this is corresponding to, there's just one natural frequency for this equation, for this idealized system. And its mode shape is just up and down in the only direction it can move in, okay? But let's look in three dimensions, because three dimensions, this real system, it's not idealized in any way. It could move, it could vibrate in, in many different directions. So how do we... Uh, you know, do a similar proof to show how to find the natural frequency or natural frequencies and mode shapes of this system. Okay, well, let's use our matrices we found. Okay, and um, let's again let's find the natural frequency of this system, set it equal to zero. Okay, in this case, we're setting it to a, a, a six by one zero vector. There, I have it shown here as a, as a matrix, but um, basically if I times these in, I, I just want to have no wrench, so it's like if I put a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 wrench on this, so no wrench on it, if I just don't even load it, let's find a twist that satisfies this equation if this is 0. Okay, well again, let's just, let's do a displacement twist that has these, these components, those are the three rotations, three translations of this point, at this point we're stuck on that stage with respect to this, and times, it times them all by this magnitude, the same guess we did before. And we plug it in there. You would find, if you take the double derivative of this and, and pull it out and then just plug that in, you would find you get this. So if you take this, plug it in there as the answer, and massage it around, you get this, okay? Which is interesting. Now what we do is just, let's just go with me here, randomly multiply both sides of that equation by MTW, so the mass, twist wrench, mass matrix inverted to both sides. And as long as we do the same thing to both sides, they're still equal, so we can do anything we want to both sides, according to algebra, right? So um, we times them both by this, and let's see what happens here. Okay, this goes in there to this. Okay, this cancels out and becomes an identity matrix, right? Because inverse of a matrix times a normal matrix equals the identity matrix. And this is just a zero matrix, okay? And so now we can actually simplify even further. This identity matrix just goes away. It's just, um, you know, twist times this equals, you plus that to the other side equals omega squared twist. Okay, now this is a very interesting form. 